For the first 40 years of the 20th century, fame had been setting up a history of its own, separate from the real one. A lot of famous people didn't do anything really historic except get famous, usually in America. But for two eventful years after the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe, it was like old times. History was back in Europe where it belonged, and the people making it were more famous than the Americans. They were running their own show again. The Americans were out of it. In private, Winston Churchill was saying that unless America came into the war, the game was up. But for the nation he led, and for the empire that his nation still controlled, the thing that mattered was what he said in public, and how he said it. All our hearts go out to the fighter pilots, whose brilliant actions we see with our own eyes day after day. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Churchill's oratory was practically all that Britain had to fight with. The wings of the few were lifted by his rhetorical flair. Few of the few got famous at the time. The fame was all Churchill's. His nation and the free world were inspired by what was really an act. But it was a real act. He was really like that. He had been training for this part all his life. Right from the start, his only role had been to lead the English-speaking peoples in a great crisis. If the great crisis had never come, he would have remained an erratic figure, fulminating at the edge of the stage, only occasionally called to the center, sent back again after saying too much. But the hour had come when he was the only man to match it. There were plenty of people around him who had better judgment. That was what told them he was their only hope. He could act the part. Without his gift for dramatizing himself, he would never have rallied his country at the last ditch. Visiting another naval base, the Prime Minister inspected officers and ratings there. Mr. Churchill was looking very fit in spite of the tremendous responsibilities now resting on his shoulders. Fortunately for Britain, But if the machinery of 20th century fame had not been so highly developed, he might have failed to get his message out. The message was himself. The camera carried it to the people. It was, in fact, a pleasant naval occasion. The Premier being pleased with all that he saw, and the Navy cheerfully determined to back up the Premier with all its might till victory is won. After he made his great speeches in the House of Commons, he made them again on the radio. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Some of Churchill's broadcasts were allegedly made by an actor reading out the speech Churchill had already delivered in the House of Commons. But what counted was those phrases drowned out in that voice. He sounded the way he looked, like a bulldog. For just long enough, he united Britons of all classes in the belief that they were a bulldog breed. The natural thing to do would have been to give in, but they did the unnatural thing and fought on. Hitler had written the script for World War II but Churchill started making up his own lines. As one actor to another, Hitler recognized Churchill as the embodiment of his country and was genuinely shocked by his refusal to see reason. The watching world couldn't help seeing the conflict in terms of personalities because that was how the personalities saw it. Hitler was Germany. Mussolini was Italy. Stalin was Russia. He couldn't believe that Hitler would attack him. He took it personally. They all did. Hitler's new order had put the old world into such a state of disorder that a nation without someone to symbolize it was as good as lost. France was lost, 
until one army officer who had escaped to England declared himself the embodiment of his nation's historic mission. Nous croyons que l'honneur des Français consiste à continuer la guerre aux côtés de leurs alliés et nous sommes résolus à le faire. Charles de Gaulle was France. He said so himself in the French language. But he had to say it on the BBC, and in France, not many people were yet listening. Not just because the Gestapo told them not to, but because very few Frenchmen knew who he was. He had only a handful of soldiers and hardly any guns. He just had an idea, free France, and he was it. La France, c'est moi. In New York, looming beside the famously tiny Mayor Fiorello LaGuardia, de Gaulle sold himself as the symbol of his nation, like a talking Eiffel Tower. Good luck to you soldiers! Good luck to you all, men and women, working for the democracy, for the liberty, for the victory! Good luck to you! Long life to New York and to American people! And America was Roosevelt, and Roosevelt was out of it. He wanted to get into it, but unlike the European men of destiny, he had to listen to the voice of the people, and too many of them wanted no part of a foreign war. The isolationists weren't necessarily cowards. One of the most prominent was the Lone Eagle himself, Charles Lindbergh. Lindbergh treasured his hard-won obscurity but gave it up again because he passionately believed that America should stay neutral. In the late 30s, he had toured Nazi Germany and become convinced that Europe was the business of the dictators, whose contemptuous attitude towards inferior breeds he had an unfortunate tendency to share. As a leading light in the America First movement, Lindbergh was effectively a weapon in Hitler's hands. France has now been defeated and despite the propaganda and confusion of recent months, it is now obvious that England is losing the war. And I have been forced to the conclusion that we cannot win this war for England regardless of how much assistance we send. That is why the America First Committee has been formed. A world threatened with rule by supermen had all its suspicions about American frivolity confirmed. America was dreamland. Everywhere else, famous people made history. In America, they made movies. Shirley Temple wasn't available, so the prodigiously gifted Judy Garland took her turn as the most famous girl in the world. She was as American as a talking mouse and wonderfully unconcerned with anything that was happening in real life. Was America coming to the world's rescue? Not yet. It was going somewhere else. The message of the Wizard of Oz was that home was best. While the outside world supermen battled it out for the sake of the future, the Americans went in search of their own past. For a screen test, the most famous of their ordinary guys climbed out of his suit again, but not to put on a uniform. He put on a costume. Gone with the Wind restaged an old war just at the moment when the rest of the world was getting caught up in a new one. It was as if America was a world apart. Clark Gable was already as famous as a man could get. The British actress Vivian Lee was made world famous overnight when she was given the part of Scarlett O'Hara. I, 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 
Adrian told you that you all this The price she paid for the gift was to be Americanized. She sounded as American as corn popping. Mr. Wilkes told me he likes to see a girl with a healthy appetite. What gentleman says and what they think is two different things. And I ain't noticed Mr. Ashley Axon for to marry you. Gone with the Wind burned Atlanta in the special effects department the same year that Hitler burned Rotterdam for real. It was as close to war as most Americans wanted to go. Come on. There was one great Hollywood star who knew that America couldn't ignore Hitler forever. Chaplin had even more experience of mass adulation than Hitler had, so he knew exactly what was going on in Der Fui's mind. But Americans weren't going to be told by one European superman that they should go to war with another. If the ordinary guy was going to fight, he would have to find the reason in his own soul. I'm not fighting for anything anymore except myself. I'm the only cause I'm interested in. Off screen, Humphrey Bogart drank seriously, but turned up for work on time, like all the other Hollywood heroes. On screen, he was the way American men saw themselves making their own decisions. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. We didn't the idea that the ordinary guy could decide his fate was an illusion. The issue of whether America should go to war was settled at Pearl Harbor. But since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. A previously anonymous people, the Japanese were overnight required to personify themselves in the form of an arch-villain. He was the Emperor Hirohito, and no trapdoor had ever produced a less likely-looking demon king. Not even the Japanese had ever seen much of their royal family. On a rare public appearance, a cheerleader had to point the public in the right direction. The West had previously known almost nothing about Emperor Hirohito and vice versa. Although on his one trip to England when he was still Crown Prince, he had met the then Prince of Wales, who was a heavy influence on his mode of dress. It was from the Prince of Wales that the future emperor acquired his daring taste for plus fours. The emperor was so divine that not even his tailor was allowed to touch him. So whatever style of clothes he wore, they all had to be fitted by eye. But they always had more charisma than he did. Hirohito was a 15 watt bulb. The day after Pearl Harbor, he was world famous as Japan's all-conquering emperor. Prime Minister Tojo was elevated at the same moment to the role of the all-conquering emperor's cold-blooded factotum. Better casting than the emperor, Tojo had the advantage of actually looking as if he had evil thoughts on his mind. Since the Japanese power structure was hard to understand even for the Japanese, it was inevitable that the press in the Allied countries would groom Tojo as the more marketable monster. Quite apart from Hitler himself, Nazi Germany was a rich source of villainous leading characters who helped to dramatize a war too big to follow into a simple battle between good and evil. Before the war, Hermann Goering had played a complicated role as the second man in Germany. Hitler, who apart from a passion for cream cakes, suffered from none of the minor vices, only all the major ones up to and including homicidal mania, had looked austere and dedicated beside Goering, a conspicuous consumer of fine wines and other people's property. Goering thought that he could divert attention from his weight problem by designing his own uniforms. It was a miscalculation on a massive scale. But Goering knew his way around a country estate, and this had fooled some of Europe's more clueless aristocrats 
into believing that despite his regrettable fondness for building concentration camps, he might be a civilizing influence on Hitler. Now the gloves were off and Goering, in his new position as commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, had emerged as a simple roly-poly figure of fun. British newsreels helped the gag along with specially edited Fatty Herman compilations, plus comic voiceover. Looky, 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 here comes the Director of Economy, Chief of Defence, Prime Minister of Prussia, Air Minister, and Hitler's number one man, Field Marshal Goering. The Nazi thin man has come to see his Luftwaffe pilots in Italy. And as his wife has sent all his medals to the cleaners, old skin and bone has a look round to see what he can pick up cheap. Well, so long, Tiny, we'll be round your way again soon. Heinrich Himmler was no joke at all. He was in charge of the SS and the Gestapo, along with all their concentration camps and torture chambers. Playing Tojo to Hitler's Hirohito, Himmler was cast as the cold-blooded horror who didn't even have the excuse of being crazy. Actually, he was as crazy as a loon, ready to spend millions of Deutschmarks on scholarly research to prove that the Japanese, like himself, were members of the Aryan race, seven-foot blue-eyed blondes in disguise. But Himmler rightly became world famous for the aspect of his character that matched his personal appearance. He looked like a mild-mannered civil servant dedicated to his work, which eventually involved the deliberate extermination of millions of people, guilty of nothing else except their supposed failure to match his own standards of physical magnificence. All the more sinister for looking so efficient, Himmler was the bad German. And Rommel was the good German. Running rings around the British in the Western Desert, Rommel combined the unorthodox glamour of T.E. Lawrence with Baron von Richthofen's knack for looking chivalrous even while he was shooting at you. If Rommel had been fighting in Russia, he might not have behaved so correctly. But the desert was blessedly short of innocent civilians, and Rommel was fighting the right enemy, the British, who love a winner so long as it isn't them. They enjoyed coming second to him so much that orders had to be issued from on high, making it an offense to call him a superman. But nobody stopped calling him decent. It was a necessary belief. Somebody on the other side had to be good, or there was no hope for mankind. And somebody on our side had to beat him. Faced with the uncomfortable challenge of admiring a superman of their own, the British came up with Bernard Law Montgomery. Like Rommel, Montgomery was good casting for a national hero. Montgomery had Churchill's positive attitude. But there were other British military commanders who had that, and they didn't become famous. Montgomery also had Churchill's gift for belligerent showmanship, and that made the difference. He was so much the fierce warrior that he looked as if he was overdoing it, even though there was a war on. My business, as you know, is fighting. Fighting the Germans. Oh, anybody else, too, who wants to have a fight. The British will admire a superior man, as long as he is eccentric, and professional soldiers didn't come more eccentric than Montgomery without being given sedatives. Why is it that today the, the tide has turned and we are beating the Germans and coming towards the final climax of the war? I'll tell you why it is. It's because we've got far the best equipment and we've got far the best men and women too. Far the best. Britain had a right to feel proud. For a long and crucial moment, it had held the fort. Now the Americans were in, but they were still getting organized. So Britain was saved from despair, but still in the forefront of the battle. It was a time for glory. Glory was the stock in trade of Britain's most glamorous aristocrat, Lord Louis Mountbatten, friend of the stars and the Navy's most dashing commander. When his destroyer, the Kelly, was hit, he brought her to harbor with her decks awash, while the nation held its breath and exhaled with a cheer. It was one of a famous man's most famous moments, 
and it was simply begging to be made into an inspiring example of the very best type of staunchly nautical British war movie, In Which We Serve, written by and starring Noel Coward in a thinly disguised portrait of Mountbatten. Can you hear me all right in the back? Yes. Good. You all know that it's the custom of the service for the captain to address the ship's company on commissioning day to give them its policy and tell them the ship's program. Now, my policy is easy. And if there are any here who have served with me before, they'll know what it is. Are there any old shipmates of mine here? All the other actors on the oh, prop ship again, were presenting a thinly Adam. disguised portrait of the ordinary okay. fighting man. And Coombe. Who's that small fellow hiding behind the chief stoker? Parkinson, sir. Parkinson, you were coxswain of the All Comers Whaler and the Valletta, weren't you? I was that, sir, when we won the All Comers Cup in the 1936 regatta. And fell into the ditch when you got to the ship. <laughs> Mountbatten was Coward's oh, friend, well, as he was the friend of everybody the famous. Mountbatten was busy fighting, but when he couldn't visit the set, he sent his relatives, the royal family, to whose fame conferred by birth had been added a new luster for their role as wartime symbols that Britain could take it. Mountbatten and a few other star officers of high rank might get famous, but everybody else served. For them, there was collective glory in what Churchill called the War of the Unknown Soldier. And the same went for the show business stars, who were expected to do their bit through doing their act, giving a voice to the stiff upper lip. Fellows do go to the club, or maybe the local pub, always tell good stories, as you all know. George Formby was popular at every level of the social scale, up to and including the king and queen. So let him go. Have you ever heard this one, have you? Wait, wait, wait. Here was convincing proof that the war had brought Britain's social classes together. If I was a pigeon, I wouldn't hop. I'd fly over Hitler and Ribbentrop, and it wouldn't be leaflets that I'd drop. You know? A skeptic might have said that they were still separate, just packed tighter in the bomb shelter. But no one was listening to skeptics. The bombs and the entertainers were too loud. Too loud and too piercing. Gracie Fields had a voice from downstairs that told upstairs people the British classes were all in the war together. Oh, I wonder if he will please remember me when he calls on Christmas Eve. When an upstairs voice delivered the same message to downstairs people, it could sound more strained. Lieutenant Lawrence Olivier of the Fleet Air Arm came home on leave to address his countrymen. We will attack! We will smite our foes! We will conquer! And in all our deeds, in this land and in other lands, from this hour on, our watchwords will be urgency, speed, courage. Urgency in all our decisions, speed in the execution of all our plans, Courage in face of all our enemies, and may God bless our cause! In Britain's tangle of mutually irritating tones, it was hard to sound natural. The only voice and face that were hard to place belonged to the woman who gave the British war effort its one true anthem. We meet again, don't know where, don't know where. Some sunny day. Vera Lynn's classless voice rang out to a nation which had never felt more like a family and an empire which had never seemed more united. America had started its own share of the struggle in a state of shock. General Douglas MacArthur was its first military hero of the war, and he led a retreat instead of an advance. He arrived in Australia to explain that his expulsion from the Philippines was only temporary. When I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Yeah. Yeah. 
tonight, I repeat those words. Yeah, 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 yeah. I shall return. Yeah, yeah. But even while he was still going backwards, the publicity-hungry MacArthur became world famous for going backwards in style. When he flew to Hawaii for the conference at which the strategy for turning defeat into victory was explained to FDR, MacArthur made sure he came out of it as if he was telling Washington what to do instead of vice versa. The top soldiers were the new stars, but only on the understanding that the war really belonged to the ordinary anonymous foot slogger, G.I. Joe, the American equivalent of Churchill's unknown soldier. The Hollywood stars could hope only to serve. And if they had already served in the previous war and were too old for this one, then their best role was to raise morale. How are our boys doing? Our boys are doing a great job. On our trip overseas, my wife and I saw thousands of American boys in Africa and Italy, and you can be awfully proud of them. We did the best we could to entertain them. But there's an organization that's looking after them in every theater of the war. The buy bonds message was a way of raising morale and money at the same time. It was an honorable contribution. That means more blood plasma, more bandages for our wounded, more aid and comfort for our prisoners of war, more aid to our fighters and their families. Bye, 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 a bond. And by and by, the bond you buy will bring you victory. Bing wasn't just crooning a new version of Boo Boo Boo. Raising funds and fighting spirit was real work. It was even dangerous work. Clark Gable's beloved wife, Carol Lombard, was killed flying in bad weather to a bond rally. But for Gable, there could be only one course of action. Against the studio's wishes, he put his career on the line and joined up. Gable trained air gunners for the 8th Air Force based in England. Though he wasn't allowed over enemy territory as often as he would have liked to have been, it was real duty. The event was duly publicized by the Air Force in the field and the studio at home, but the only line to take was that a mythical creature had resumed human proportions. The ordinary guy hero really was an ordinary guy after all. The actual man had replaced the legend. James Stewart was another big star who volunteered for the same reduction process, strengthening his links with reality but putting his fame on hold for as long as he was away from the screen. Douglas Fairbanks Jr. went into the Navy. The stars who joined the services could be released to make movies deemed important to the war effort, but there was no avoiding a hiccup to their careers. David Niven, a British actor who was starting to make it big in Hollywood, would have made it bigger if he had not gone home and joined up. The pictures he made when on leave in England were strictly for empire consumption. But I just want to tell you this. If you ever get near any real fighting, I don't suppose you'll ever be good enough. But if you do, you'll find that you're looking to other men not to let you down. If you're lucky, you'll have soldiers like Captain Edwards and Sergeant Fletcher to look to. If they're lucky, they'll be with another company. Doing his duty right, cost him the Hollywood starring roles that would have put him on top. The same was true of Ronald Reagan. Much mockery was fated to be aroused by the fact that he spent his war service making training films in Hollywood. The nearest he got to the front line was a movie called This Is The Army. What does that mean we're supposed to stop living? Is Johnny Jones private citizen? Yes. I'm Corporal Jones. I don't know how long it'll take to get back to being Johnny Jones private citizen. But until I am, I don't intend to leave anyone on my conscience back home. It's only logic. But Reagan's eyesight was so poor, there was no question of his seeing active service. He could barely see Joan Leslie. After the war is the time for taking a wife. The stars who served in any capacity were on more certain moral ground than those who continued their pre-war heroics in prop uniform. Errol Flynn was 4F, medically unfit to fight. But he almost started a war of his own when he starred as the American who outwitted an unusually clueless Japanese army in Hollywood's most notorious war movie, Objective Burma. 
The trouble was that the war in Burma was fought mainly by Britain. The Hollywood film moguls had dismissed this as a side issue, but when the film was screened to British Empire troops, there was a mass cry of derision. Fighting the enemy was one thing, putting up with the ally was another. Yeah? Good morning, my name is Frank Sinatra. What? <sighs> Columbus had more chance than me when he set sail to cross the sea. At least he thought he knew what he was doing. And I'm in search of something too, exactly what I wish I knew. Yes, I pursue, but who am I pursuing? Frank Sinatra was 4F and touchingly young, but like more established stars, he did his bit for bond sales. Bond buyers get orchids with the voice Frank as the pinup pin boy. Going into the front line of publicity with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby was probably a better thing for the bony baritone to do than tote a rifle. Don't dance all night with me till the stars fade from above. They'll say it's all right with me. It wasn't Sinatra's fault that the Bobby Soxers went crazy about him. The Bobby Soxer was the female component of the newly powerful teenage subgroup, and she thought Sinatra had been manufactured in heaven to gratify her desires. But American servicemen overseas thought it was his fault, and non-Americans everywhere had all their old fears confirmed that America was living in a world of its own. As long as there's music and words of romance the spell of a theme starts you to dream there's always a chance as long as there's music if america had been living in a world of its own american culture might have been easier to resist but the sound america made traveled everywhere like a lullaby It was called Swing, and it had already made Glenn Miller a world-famous name. When the American troops advanced, their culture advanced with them, marching to its own music. Miller went into uniform, a colonel whose regiment was his band. Along with the American forces preparing for the invasion of Nazi-occupied Europe, Miller first of all prepared to invade a friendly country. For the second time in a generation, the youth of America is marching off to war. But this time to new and livelier rhythms, a new style of bandsmen like Captain Glenn Miller. This is the wartime tempo of a fighting but light-hearted nation. Miller himself vanished on the way into Europe, but there were more where he came from. Betty Grable was the most famous American woman in the war because she didn't appear just on the screen. She was pasted to footlockers and painted on the sides of tanks and aircraft to raise the morale of men who hoped they might come home to a girl like her, or at any rate, come home. Rita Hayworth was a greatly talented beauty who had shone as one of Fred Astaire's best partners. The war transformed her into an upmarket dream girl, which didn't help her self-respect. But Catherine Hepburn could never be pinned down as a pin-up. She was too bright for that. You do have something to talk about. Yeah, yeah, you. Whether on screen or off, Hepburn like proved herself the equal of any man. Now, how do you feel about being you? I feel very good about it. Always have. I uh, like knowing more about what goes on than most people. She was Spencer Tracy's partner in life as in art, but she was an equal partner. 
A lot of drink in these. Oh, I don't know. Well, I'm just mean if you're not used to them, you know. Oh, don't worry about me. As a diplomat's daughter, I've had to match drinks with a lot of people. From uh, remittance men to international spies. And I may say I've never wound up under the table. America was sending a powerful message to the world through its famous people. The message was that their country was so rich, it had a way of life that the war hardly touched. The message was rubbed in by the appointment of Dwight D. Eisenhower, a supreme commander of the Allied forces invading Europe. Ike had the knack of getting on with everybody. He could soothe ruffled feathers like Bing singing. He had zero charisma, but that helped. Nobody resented him. The mastermind of D-Day looked and spoke like a sales director for a vacuum cleaner company. Any person, whether he is at the plow in the field or with a gun at the front, that fails to do his full duty every day, every hour, must forever bear on his own conscience the certainty that he's contributed in some incalculable amount, be it little or be it great, to the agony and the anguish and the sacrifice that our two countries must endure. America had gone into the war business and out-organized everybody else. They had captured a global market. Even Eisenhower's name sounded like a reminder to Hitler that the Americans didn't just have better dance music than the Germans. They had better Germans than the Germans. Why, it's Marlena Dietrich! Under Nazi pressure, Marlena Dietrich had renounced her German citizenship, but she had kept her German accent. Reach for the sky, you coyotes. It's me, Dead-Eye Dietrich, the sheriff. Cheapers, it's the arm of the law. The legs ain't bad either. Her presence in the forward areas was a sign that fame in America was a passport to everywhere. Forget that you're a woman? Yes. <laughs> Is she kidding? Taking the war over, their top soldiers seemed to be unbeatable at showbiz. When the Americans moved to center stage in the Western Theater, their star warrior was General Patton. From North Africa to Sicily and on into Normandy, he moved in a blaze of publicity. On any objective assessment, Patton's get-up of jodhpurs, high boots, lacquered helmet, and twin pearl-handled guns made Mussolini's dress sense look understated. Some of Patton's opinions were likewise difficult to distinguish from fascism. When he slapped a shell-shocked soldier in Sicily, he had to be reminded on pain of dismissal that America was a democracy. Patton proved that Americans could be led by an entertainer as long as they thought he knew where he was going. Patton was going to Germany. He wasn't allowed to go to Paris. General de Gaulle was regarded by the Allied leaders as an even bigger prima donna than Montgomery, but in de Gaulle's own eyes, he was justified. He was the symbol of his country whose battered pride had to be restored. De Gaulle insisted on liberating Paris before the Americans. It almost happened, but one American beat him to it. It was Ernest Hemingway, reconquering the Ritz bar on behalf of civilization. Famous people who had stayed on in Paris during the Nazi occupation now emerged as resistance heroes. One of them really was. Josephine Baker had risked her life and was awarded the Legion of Honor. The famous intellectuals Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir were more dubious resistance heroes because there was no evidence that they had done any actual resisting. When Maurice Chevalier was accused of being a collaborator, he said that although he had sung to audiences full of German officers, he had been carrying out secret intelligence work. Picasso had sat out the occupation in expensive restaurants eating black market food, but now emerged as a champion of the oppressed proletariat. Jean Cocteau was a known collaborator, but was forgiven because he was famous for his extreme sensitivity. Coco Chanel had at least been honest enough to live openly with a high-ranking German officer. After the liberation, there were suggestions that the famous couturier should be fitted with a couture noose. She and her friend prudently decamped to Switzerland until the fast died down. Italy was out of the war, and so was Mussolini. 
the ex-Superman was strung up beside his mistress, mocked by some of the same people who had cheered him while he lived. If there had been life in his eyes, he would have seen his world turned upside down. Almost killed in a bomb plot, his military genius, long since exposed as opportunism mixed with folly, Hitler, in his last days, was a trembling wreck. The Third Reich shrank to the size of one bunker under Berlin, where Hitler, determined to remain in charge of the production, even though the budget had run out, arranged his own final curtain. He committed suicide. His body was drenched with petrol, and a man who had never grown up shared the fate he had wished on millions of children who had never grown up either. Fanatical admirers later preferred to believe that he had gone on tour in Argentina. But fanatical admirers had suddenly grown few. When the war ended in Europe, even the victors were defeated. Churchill said he had not become prime minister in order to preside over the breakup of the British Empire. He ceased to be prime minister and the empire began to break up. The war in the Pacific took longer to finish than the war in Europe, but it could only end one way. Einstein had already decided the issue. At last it became clear to everyone what he had meant by his famous equation E equals mc squared. Energy is set equal to mass multiplied with the square of the velocity of light showed that very small amount of mass may be converted into a very large amount of energy. The victory looked as if it belonged to MacArthur. He had made certain it would look that way by fulfilling his I shall return promise in the Philippines with all the cameras rolling. At the Japanese surrender on board the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, he was the master of ceremonies. These proceedings are closed. MacArthur went on to become ruler of Japan. Emperor Hirohito renounced his divinity in favor of MacArthur, who gladly took it on. Hirohito, never a likely superman, moved among his people for the first time in his life. The only Superman who had gone into the war and come out smiling on the other side was Stalin. As the Red Army advanced through Eastern Europe, it had switched off the few lights of liberty the Nazis had missed, and now that the war was over, the military genius quietly demoted the generals who had fought it for him and made sure that his own country got back to normal with the people's admiration centered exclusively on himself. They had no choice, so their worship was understandable. But even abroad, there were those who believed that Stalin was the iron hand of history, fate's choice, even if he had never stood for election, a chancy process he had always taken care to avoid. Ever since I have first heard my name connected with possible political office, I have consistently declined to consider or discuss such a contingency. I am a soldier. I belong to the Army. The Army lives to serve the American people, and no political party whatsoever. Eisenhower might genuinely not have wanted the limelight, but it wanted him. America's war economy had turned it into peacetime's international world power. Ike had run the war as a successful business, so he looked like a good choice to run the peace that way. He didn't look like an ex-soldier because he had never looked like a soldier. It was only now, with the shooting safely over, that the true American military hero finally emerged in his full glory. Give me a hand with this pack. John Wayne had never fired a shot during the war, 
But now that the war was being refought in Hollywood, he had thousands of shots fired at him. Luckily, on Hollywood's version of Iwo Jima, the Japanese had been issued with bullets that bounced off tall actors running slowly. It was nonsense, but it was famous nonsense. The fame machinery, which had been kept under some measure of control during the War of the Unknown Soldier, was back on the loose. Worse than that, there was more of it. One of the new post-war domestic appliances, the one standing in the corner of the living room, was ready to unleash a new kind of American hero. He didn't sound much like an ordinary guy, nor was it immediately clear that he had come to save civilization. This is Liberace in Hollywood saying, I'll see you in the morning sun. And when the night is new, I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. On tomorrow night's Clive James fame in the 20th century, television arrives and reshapes the course of celebrity. Liberace and Lucille Ball leap to fame on the small screen. Yes, with Vitamina Benjamin, you can spoon your way to health. <laughs> All you do is take a tablespoonful after every meal. Uh, now you take some. Oh. <laughs> it's so tasty, too. <laughs> Hollywood responds with bigger screens and steamier sex. A new first family reinvents Camelot and redefines glamour. A young boxer named Cassius Clay bursts upon the fight scene. Four young lads from Liverpool cross the ocean and change the face of pop music. The world is shaken by a series of assassinations, and the Manson family make crime another path to celebrity. Joseph McCarthy, Grace Kelly, Pablo Picasso, and Alec Guinness are just a few members of the greatest cast ever assembled, appearing on tomorrow night's episode of Clive James' Fame in the 20th Century. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. This is PBS.